Number 10, Cordyceps Jones. Cordyceps Jones is one of my favorites of the cosmic villains mentioned on this list. He is definitely a super weirdo. Basically a mushroomy looking space mobster who was made up of fungal spores. While he might sound ridiculous, he is not a villain that you want to underestimate, trust me. He both looks and is terrifying, most recently using one of his casinos to threaten the existence of the entire planet of Earth by creating a betting pool based around its destruction. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that like. Number 9, The Brood. Despite being a bunch of insectoid alien critters, The Brood are actually among one of the most normal of the weirdos on our list. They kind of resemble the monstrous species we see in Alien. And likewise, they are usually known for bursting through people's stomachs. The Brood also seek out hosts to incubate their young, which then of course burst out of the host's bodies to be born. Pretty much just like we see happen in Alien. Something interesting and bizarre that we know about The Brood too, is that they don't just do this for survival sake because you know it's required for them to continue to exist as a species, they actually enjoy terrorizing others throughout the cosmos. Inflicting pain and causing panic is something pretty much all brood enjoy, giving them actual gratification from the violent acts that they commit. In fact, in their race, it's actually weird to feel a sense of empathy or compassion for others and to not enjoy pain, which is why Brew was ostracized and left to die by the brood queen before he was then found and taken in by the X-Men. And weirdly, in his case, the ability to be friendly and kind is actually like his mutant power as a brute because, I mean, that is a mutation. Number 8, The Phalanx. Phalanx are some of the most freaky of the villainous cosmic alien races we have over at Marvel Comics. They are believed to have been created by the Technarchy, but I don't think they have actually been made aware of this connection, probably because the Technarchy doesn't want them to know that. Like the Borg who likely inspired them, they are a cybernetic race focused on assimilating other worlds. They don't take you to a cube to experiment on you though, but instead infect you with the techno-organic virus, which then slowly changes you into a cyborg, erasing everything with in you that is organic and turning you techno. Techno organic, some might say. Number 7, Dark Celestials. So weird. Because when you think about it, the Celestials and even the Dark Celestials actually are a big part of the reason that we even have life on Earth in Marvel Comics. In fact, their existence could even be used to explain the sheer number of superpowered beings that are on Earth as well. The progenitor who appeared in AXE Judgment Day after being resurrected by the Avengers and Eternals is actually the first to have become corrupted. Dark Celestials are just Celestials, godlike cosmic beings, who were corrupted by the Horde. The progenitor did initially not turn dark, but instead died as a result of this, falling to planet Earth billions of years ago. The Celestial who searched for the progenitor became corrupted by the corpse they found and then they were turned dark, thereby creating the Dark Celestials and actually becoming the first Dark Celestial, but not the first person to be infected by the horde. Number 6, Fear Master. Daryl King was a board member of the dictatorial Alchemex Corporation in charge of the private police force known as Public Eye Unlimited. At the same time, he was also secretly leading the criminal cartel known as Cyber Nostra, proving that even in the future you need two jobs to make a decent living. Daryl used his unique position to play both sides and enrich himself while avoiding detection, going under the alias Fear Master for his criminal activities. He was given a mutated hand by an alien an entity called Kelmizadek, which let him calcify or turn people's flesh into minerals such as gold, stone, and everything in between. It also let him de-age people. He called this power the Midas Touch, and used it to create a display room called the Endymion Room, where he kept the altered dead bodies of all the women he had touched and transformed over the years. He was one of the main antagonists for the 2099 Punisher, although he mostly fought the Punisher with his connections and by sending hired assassins after him rather than directly confronting him. Even so, he is a powerful villain both due to his political power and his superpowers. Number 5, Goblin. The 2099 version of Spider-Man has 2099 versions of several of the original Spidey's enemies, such as this version of the Green Goblin, simply known as Goblin. The Goblin is really a Catholic priest, Father Jennifer D'Angelo. Her goblin suit was the source of her powers, which allowed her to fly with giant purple wings and shoot energy blasts at her enemies instead of pumpkin bombs. 
arms. The suit also granted her super strength and was capable of projecting hallucinations, an ability she used to trick Spider-Man into attacking civilians that she had made look like her. Her goal is to replace Spider-Man as the defender of downtown Nueva York as she believes that Spider-Man is a corporate tool, but her methods and willingness to team up with criminals like the 2099 Vulture earn her a spot on this list of villains. Number 4. Flipside During the heroic age, an android called Flipside was created and programmed to emulate the powers of whatever superhero it first came across. It was eventually found by a band of thieves who believed the robot was broken. It was actually still in scanning mode, trying to find a hero that matched its records. When Flipside encountered the Spider-Man of 2099, he scanned him but had trouble recognizing him as he clearly was not the original Spider-Man he had on file. In order to complete its objective, the android combined the templates it had on file of the original Spider-Man and the original Venom to create its personality and power set. He came to life and jumped into Spider-Man's arms, declaring himself to be Spidey's new best friend. The merged personalities caused him to become psychotic, telling Spider-Man, I'm gonna be your bestest friend for the rest of your whole life if that's okay with you, and if not, well fine, then I'll kill ya. When Spider-Man rejected him, Flipside began using his powers to kill all the nearby scavengers, seeming to shrug off their bullets. Spider-Man managed to defeat him, but once he left, Flipside merely reassembled himself and kept killing the scavengers. Number 3. Electro 2099 This version of Electro is actually an android who was designed to be a construction worker. Unfortunately, his masters were not satisfied with his work, and much like the bosses here at Top 10 Nerd do when they aren't pleased with our performances, the android was sold to torture experimenters. No, really. Haven't you ever wondered what happened to all the other hosts this channel has had? Only Amanda has a fan base big enough to keep her safe. Torture experimenters were people who used robots to test the effectiveness of the various torture methods they were developing in the dystopian nightmare that is Marvel's 2099. When the android was being tortured with electricity, however, the overload fried his obedience chip, making him self-aware and able to rebel against his masters. A generator accident gave him electric power such as electrokinesis, energy absorption, and flight, and he took took on the identity of Electro, joining the new version of the Sinister Six in order to take on the Spider-Man of 2099. Number 2. Venom 2099 Kron Stone is actually the half-brother of the 2099 Spider-Man, Miguel O'Hara. He is a ruthless psychopath who gets a perverse thrill from hurting other people. He was a mercenary working with the infamous Skin Posse until he was seemingly killed in battle and dumped in the sewer. It turned out that when he entered the water, he was not quite dead, and he floated through the sewer system until by total coincidence he came across the Venom symbiote that had caused Peter Parker all those troubles years ago. The symbiote had been hiding for years, maturing, but once it bonded with Kron, it transformed him into the new Venom. He possesses all of the original Venom's powers, such as super strength, agility, web slinging, and the like, but as the symbiote has had more time to mature, it has also developed more powers that this Venom can take advantage of. The new Venom has acidic blood and saliva, not unlike the xenomorphs featured in the Alien series. He devoted himself to destroying the new Spider-Man's life by trying to kill him and his loved ones, even managing to fridge Spidey's love interest, Dana. Spider-Man soon discovered Venom's weakness to Sonics and used the citywide intercom system to defeat and capture his estranged brother. Number 1. Brimstone Love In the 2099 timeline, one of the most twisted and evil sources of entertainment is the Theater of Pain. They used human misery as the main attraction, putting on sadistic displays for the crowd. Their leader is perhaps the most evil and ruthless of them all, Brimstone Love. Love. He claims that he draws his power from the molten core of the earth, and he channels it into his powerful pyrokinesis. He used this ability to easily burn through the steel walls of the 2099 X-Men's headquarters and fight the mutant Skullfire. While Skullfire was able to draw his power from nearby energy sources, he soon exhausted all the nearby energy and was soon defeated by Brimstone, who has no limit to how much fire he can cast due to his source of power being the earth itself. In addition to his pyrokinesis, Brimstone Love also has super strength and durability and teleportation powers, which allowed him to hold his own in a fight against the entire X-Men team, only being defeated once one of his own team turned against him and used the Theater of Pain's telepathic technology against him in X-Men 2099, issue 25. Number 10, Venture First up, we have this cyborg from the future. We first met Venture when he was going by the name Queeg and living in the ruins of Nueva York. Other post-apocalyptic people who talk about him say that he is one of the greatest hunters in the world in his time. He's not technically from the 2099 timeline, otherwise known as Earth 928, but is actually from an alternate possible future timeline that has been designated
orbited Earth 15,329. This timeline was created when Miguel O'Hara became trapped in our present day and couldn't get back to his version of the future. Miguel was able to create a portal that would let him travel to the future for 10 minutes at a time. But Quig found out about this and set up camp in the future, waiting for the portal to open so he could go to our present day. And yes, I know how convoluted this sounds. This is why I generally don't like when Marvel tries to do time travel stories. When Quig got to present day New York, Miguel recognized him as a villain from the future called Venture. Having not yet experienced this, Quig was confused, but eventually decided that he liked the name so much that he adopted it, making Spider-Man kind of responsible for naming the villain through some weird time travel paradox. Venture is a gifted hunter and strategist whose cybernetic enhancements grant him increased strength and allow him to keep up with and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Spider-Man and the 2099 version of Captain America. He has had five appearances in the 2099 comics and therefore hasn't gotten the chance to show how capable he really is, but perhaps he can earn a higher spot in our future, which would of course be his past. Number 9. Vulture 2099 In the 2099 story, New York kept expanding and eventually ran out of room, so they began building upwards instead. The more wealthy citizens got to stay in the new upper city while the poor and downtrodden were left in the old undercity. In order to survive, they formed various gangs or cliques as they refer to them as. Some of these cliques are the throwbacks, the scavs, the trumps, and the thorities. The largest of these groups are called the freakers and they are led by the 2099 version of the vulture. Like the original vulture, this guy uses a winged flight suit in order to take to the skies and attack his enemies. He doesn't seem to have the intelligence of the original Adrian Toomes, so it is unlikely that he developed the wingsuit himself, but however he attained it, he makes good use of it. Unlike the original vulture, his wings are sharpened to a razor sharp point, allowing him to swoop down and instantly behead his enemies. He first appeared in Spider-Man 2099 Volume 1 Issue 6, where he rescued Spider-Man from the futuristic private police force known as Public Eye in hopes that Spider-Man would help him destroy the evil Alchemex Corporation so he could have control of the skies. Any inclination Spider-Man had to help the Vulture with his goals was quickly destroyed when he discovered that the Vulture had been cooking and eating the bodies of his fallen foes. As he said in his second appearance in Spider-Man 2099 Issue 7, Oh come on, Spider-Man. Didn't you ever hear of finger foods? Number 8. Jigsaw 2099 Originally known as Multifractor, this villain was a grav ball player, whatever the hell that means, who made a turn to crime as an enforcer for the Cyber Nostra group. He was an experienced combatant who was able to effectively stand up to the 2099 version of the Punisher before eventually being killed by the futuristic anti-hero. His body was found by a mortician who had made a really bizarre career pivot into being a veteran. For some reason, this made him capable of bringing Multifractor back from the dead. He replaced one of the villain's arms with that of a gorilla, and the other with a robotic one sporting a massive razor-sharp hook. He also seems to have giant goat legs for some reason. Despite being able to bring a dead guy back to life, the vet was unable to make the end result cosmetically pleasing, but Multifractor actually really dug his new look. He went after the Punisher again, but had adopted the name Jigsaw due to his stitched-together appearance. He was a formidable foe for Punisher, but was eventually defeated and found by a gang who he took control of and led until ceding leadership to his old boss, the Fear Master. But more on him later. Number 7. Tiger Wild One night in the country of Latveria in the year 2099, a portal opened, spitting out a man dressed as the long disappeared ruler of Latveria, Victor Von Doom. Despite the fact that the man under the mask was far too young to be the real Doom, he somehow had all the original's powers and memories. He set about reclaiming claiming his throne, as he soon discovered that the country was under the control of a dictator named Tiger Wild. Tiger had been a high-level executive for the evil Alchemax Corporation before leaving the company and taking over Latveria. Although he had saved the nation from being taken over by the corporate forces that had seized control of many of the planet's other nations, he now ruled the nation with an iron fist, squashing any who dared oppose his rule. Doom used his power armor to cut through Tiger's security to get to the new Latverian ruler. He confronted him, but was shocked when Tiger turned out to be a cyborg with enhanced strength and the ability to redirect the energy in Doom's suit to overload him and take him out of commission. He removed Doom's mask, seeing that this man, who seemed to have all of Doom's memories, was not disfigured. He took the opportunity to make the new Doom more historically accurate, before having him sent away. It was only through the help of Wilde's tarot reader, Fortune, that Doom was able to survive, upgrade his equipment, and eventually overcome.
overthrow Wild. There are other 2099 villains more powerful than Tiger Wild, but the fact that he was able to take over a country and defeat Doctor Doom in combat makes him worth mentioning. By the way, Doom isn't on this list as he doesn't really do anything too villainous in the 2099 timeline. Number 6. The Phoenix Force Now it's important to say the Phoenix Force is not a villain, technically. It is a cosmic entity representing all life in the Omniverse. The Phoenix Force will exist as long as there is, was, or will be life. If the Phoenix Force were to be destroyed, if that were even possible, all life would follow after it, as well as the ability for life to have begun in the first place. The Phoenix Force is just a force of nature, but it has been used as a darker force of power in the past. For example, when it inhabited Jean Grey during the Dark Phoenix Saga. It was at this time the entity was a villain, using Jean's insane levels of psychic power which it then amplified to godlike levels. With this entity inhabiting her body, Jean and the Phoenix destroyed an entire solar system and attacked her fellow ex. Jean had to actually bring her own end just to stop what was happening, and when the Phoenix regained its memories of all the evil it had done, it brought Jean back to life to help make things a little better. And that's not the only time. There was the whole X-Men vs Avengers thing, and there was that time that Thane, Thanos' son, had the Phoenix Force. Almost every time the power of the Phoenix Force comes up, it usually corrupts its bearer and makes like a big, a big stink. Like a huge stink. Big old fart. Number 5. Dormammu Most fans of Doctor Strange know Dormammu. This this being composed of pure magic energy rules the dark dimension and spends most of his time taking over other realities as he finds them. He is essentially immortal and capable of wielding godly power over magic, the dead, souls, and pretty much anything really. When he is in our reality, he can be thwarted and returned to his own, usually by the Sorcerer Supreme, but within the dark dimension, he reigns supreme and cannot be taken down like at all. Using his vast magical abilities and the influence of his power, he is constantly trying to invade our reality and even when he is banished back or he is stopped he always comes back eventually and he has been doing this for millennia. Number 4. The Beyonder The Beyonder is a singular entity with no duplicate versions of himself in other universes, similar to the Phoenix Force. And also a lot like the Phoenix Force, Beyonder is basically like a baby in that he is a younger member of a race called the Beyonders that are a near omnipotent alien race from a dimension outside of the multi Universe. He is himself basically a whole universe. It, it's really hard to explain. But as he observes Earth in the Marvel Universe and the various races, he gets a little curious and the Beyonder decides to study and analyze life and humanity, good and evil and conflict, and to that purpose he pits Earth's mightiest heroes and villains against each other in the Secret Wars. Now, he did this by destroying an entire system of planets and creating battle world from the remains and from parts of Earth. So that's one level of power right there. There. Beyonder's powers surpass that of Eternity and the Living Tribunal, but that has been retconned recently. And he is capable of manipulating reality to his will, being able to pretty much do whatever he wants and then grant himself any power he wants. It was actually a huge treat though last year in the Defenders Beyond story when we learned that the Beyonder and his race were actually still in existence and he was now an adult existing with the rest of the adult Beyonders outside of the multiverse and being all levels of wildly insanely powerful. There's a lot I skimmed over here to make it less confusing but you should just go read all the secret wars if you want to see how crazy these beings actually are. Number 3. Sidorak Sidorak, also known as the Destroyer, is an incredibly powerful extra dimensional being who was worshipped as a god and as a demon by the primitive humans of Earth until he was banished back to the Crimson Cosmos, which is where he comes from. Now, as the Destroyer, Sidorak's main goal is to just cause destruction and raise destructive power. Simple as that. To do this, though, from the Crimson Cosmos and also to win a wager with eight other like godlike deities like himself, he created the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, which allows him to select a person to be his avatar, enhancing them to become the indestructible and immortal Juggernaut, which kind of gives us two different versions of Unstoppable all wrapped up into one package. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. This is for you. As the Juggernaut is essentially a physically unstoppable force of kinetic energy, unless you're the Hulk, I guess, then you can stop him. 
I don't know why. Anyways, Sidorak is such a powerful and unstoppable godlike entity that you will even hear magic users invoking his name to cast some of their strongest spells. For example, the Crimson Bands of Sidorak. Number two, the Chaos King. While he is relatively obscure, he is nothing to scoff at. Amatsumi Kobashi, first appearing in Thor Blood Oath number six in 2006, was mistaken as the Japanese god of chaos and evil, but in actuality, he was an aspect of the cosmic being Oblivion. Now, Mikabashi ruled and thrived over the earth when it was nothing more than a formless void of primordial darkness. And as such, his goal now is to put an end to creation and bring about a new age of chaos and void and darkness. He is a primordial being who was imprisoned in Yomi, which is the Shinto underworld, which is where he remained for centuries, accruing an army of Oni, which is Shinma demons, and other monsters. Now, during the events of Ares' God of War, Chaos King attacks Olympus after he defeated and controlled the Japanese pantheon of gods, and after the fall of Asgard during Ragnarok. This is what kind of kickstarts his mission in Chaos War, where he slays the Egyptian gods, Celtic gods, Shi'ar gods, gods of Zen law, he takes out Nightmare in the Dream Dimension, destroys Mephisto, and casts Mistress Death out of hell, making her literally run away. And he releases the souls of the damned. He did all that. He has the power to defeat Eternity, and is practically unfazed by attacks from the likes of Zeus. God Hercules, Galactus, Silver Surfer, and Thor together could not defeat Chaos King. To win, Hercules had to literally punch him into a portal to an endless void of nothingness, and this was after he destroyed 98.76% of the entire universe. That's a lot. Number one, Cthone. Cthone is one of the most powerful demons to ever exist. Even though he predates anything like this, of all the devil-like demons out there, including Mephisto, Cthone is the closest thing to the actual devil. He and his Ngari actually ruled the earth before the angel Lucifer attacked them, and that was before Lucifer ever rebelled against heaven and became the actual devil. Cthone himself is responsible for all the witches, werewolves, vampires, and other dark creatures, as well as being the master of the most powerful form of magic, chaos magic, which is the same stuff used by the Scarlet Witch. The Scarlet Witch has altered all of reality with just a fraction of that magic, so yeah. It's a lot. His opposite, Oshter, is one of the three beings that make up the Vishanti, and they stand in direct opposition to Cthone specifically, creating the Book of Vishanti in response to Cthone's Darkhold. Other demons and dark sorcerers, including Dormammu and Mephisto, call on Cthone's name to cast some of their strongest spells. And the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange, was almost corrupted and permanently taken out by Cthone's mere presence alone. He is extremely hard to bring down, and even if you manage to do so, it's only a matter of time until he comes back. In a 10 Green Goblin, in his pursuit for ultimate power, Norman Osborn devised a plan to unite all of New York's independent gangs under his leadership, aiming to establish himself as the most formidable gang lord in the city. To assert his dominance and gain notoriety, he targeted Spider-Man as his chosen victim and dispatched two criminals, Scorcher and the Headsman, to eliminate the Web Slinger. Their failure, though, led Osborn to adopt a persona reminiscent of a childhood nightmare, transforming into the Green Goblin. However, the chemicals that he used caused the Green Goblin to become a separate entity within Osborn's mind. As Norman's memories resurfaced, the Green Goblin persona sought to dominate him and defeat Spider-Man once and for all, this time employing a bomb filled with gas that nullified the hero's wall crawling ability. However, Spider-Man outsmarted the Green Goblin again by leading him to a hospital room that had Norman's son, who was suffering from an overdose. Confronted with the dire consequences of his actions, Norman regained his sanity and returned to his normal state temporarily, but of course, you can't really, you can't get rid of the Green Goblin. You can't kill what's already dead. In a nine, Dr. Doom. Victor Von Doom, also known as Dr. Doom, is a Latvarian politician and the ruler of the Kingdom of Latveria. He conceals his scarred face behind an iron mask and armor, and is renowned for his unparalleled intellect and scientific prowess. Doom is considered one of the brightest minds on Earth. In addition to his scientific abilities, he possesses formidable skills in sorcery, placing him among the most powerful magic users in the universe. So, I mean, with a slight caveat, I'll talk about that in a second. With ambitions of bringing 
bringing order to humanity through world domination, of course, Doom had clashed with superheroes and cosmic entities alike. He is most notably recognized as the nemesis of Reed Richards and the arch enemy of the Fantastic Four, which is probably where he's getting the street level title. And his initial encounter with the team involved capturing Sue Storm and coercing the others to retrieve the mystical stones of Merlin through time travel. He later manipulated Namor into joining forces with him in an attempt to destroy the Fantastic Four, but then, after sacrificing the reanimated body of his first love that he was using as a familiar, Doom gets her skin as his new armor, along with stronger magical powers, which he then uses to neutralize the Fantastic Four. Eventually, though, Reed ends up taunting Doom enough for him to anger the demons that he made a deal with to get the skin armor, which I'm also, that's actually a thing. He, he was wearing the skin of his dead lover as armor, and as a consequence of angering those demons, Doom is taken to hell. This is not even a joke, this was an actual story. Okay, and you all thought that Iron Man Jr. in the MCU was a weird storyline. Okay, at least Peter didn't have to go to hell. Speaking of Spider-Man, in it ate Mysterio. From a young age, Quentin Beck developed a passion for movies and special effects, fostering a close bond with his cousin, Maguire Beck. Quentin's father may not have been successful, but Maguire's father supported Quentin's interests by giving him his first movie camera. With this camera, Quentin began making his own home movies and honing his skills in stop-motion special effects. As he grew older, Quentin became both an accomplished special effects expert and a skilled stuntsman. However, he grew frustrated with the lack of recognition that he was getting for his work. Desperate for fame, Quentin found inspiration when a co-worker jokingly suggested that he use his expertise in special effects to become a costumed villain and take down Spider-Man. The suggestion sparked an idea in Quentin's mind, pushing him down the path of becoming an infamous villain that he had always wanted to be. I have him on this list mostly because I wanted to be a special effects artist. I used to do stop motion videos. I, I got a camera and I started making really bad effect videos. This is basically me, except my name is not Quentin Beck. And I'm also not currently a supervillain, although I am probably going through my origin story right now. In at seven, Kingpin. The early life of the Kingpin, Wilson Fisk, remains shrouded in mystery. He's described himself as an unpopular and overweight child who later dedicated himself to bodybuilding, but that that's yet to be really, like, so solidly confirmed. Growing up in poverty, though, Fisk claims that his father was an addict, and that he committed his first kill at the age of 12. Fisk was driven to excel in everything that he pursued, believing that physical strength was crucial for gaining power in the criminal underworld. He extensively trained in various forms of combat and bodybuilding, focusing on sumo wrestling, and his interest in these things would shape other aspects of his life. Despite limited formal education, Fisk became self-taught, miraculously consuming books on various subjects with a particular fascination for political science. Recognizing the significance of intelligence, intelligence, Fisk realized that using political techniques could help him organize and lead a criminal enterprise. And by the age of 15, his adeptness at administration and organization earned him the moniker Kingpin of Crime, where I, at 15, I, I was trying to remember where I put my, my phone, for God's sakes. I would not be able to be organized, let alone run a criminal empire, which is why I'm on YouTube and not Wall Street. Ha. Number six, Namor. Namor was introduced in the 610 universe in Ultimate Fantastic Four number 24, when the four were helping Mary Storm with her discovery of Atlantis, and they found a sarcophagus which contained Namor. The translation of the Atlantean language said that Namor was king of Atlantis before it was destroyed. However, they soon discovered that this Namor was much less noble than his 616 counterpart. A revised translation revealed that he had not been entombed, he had been imprisoned, and that he was not a king, but the most dangerous super criminal in all of Atlantean history. He tried to seduce Sue Storm, but was rejected. He didn't take this well and went on a rampage. He went toe to toe with the thing, withstood the full force of the Human Torch's power, stretched Mr. Fantastic almost to the breaking point, and smashed through Sue's force fields. He defeated the team and held the city hostage with a tsunami, threatening to destroy the city unless Sue gave him a kiss. She complied and Namor departed. In subsequent appearances, he has been a bit more chill and did lose some fights, but that debut says it all. Number five, 
Magneto. Ultimate Magneto has all the powers that the original does, but none of his mercy. He doesn't just view mutants as superior to humans. He views humans as insects. In one of his most amazing moments, he stormed Washington with sentinels that he had reprogrammed and dragged the president naked onto the White House lawn to kill him. The only reason that he was stopped by the X-Men was because his own son, Quicksilver, saw that things had gone too far and betrayed his father, removing his helmet with his super speed. In his biggest plot, he actually proved how much of a nearly unstoppable force he could really be. In Ultimatum, Magneto had been driven mad at the loss of his children, and he decided that rather than destroying humanity in order to make the world safe for mutants, he's just gonna kill everyone. He uses a doomsday device and his powers to shift the world off of its axis, causing disasters all over the globe. Much of Europe, including all of Latveria, is frozen under a layer of ice, and New York is hit by a massive tidal wave. Millions of people all over the world die in the attack. He plans on using the plan again to decimate the rest of the world, but all of the heroes left in the world team up to stop him, and Cyclops ends up killing him. But the fact that he got as far into his plan as he did, and that it took literally every hero in the world working together to stop him, is pretty impressive. Number four, Apocalypse. So the 1610 version of Apocalypse is one of the most changed versions of a classic villain. This universe's Mr. Sinister was a scientist who had a psychotic break and believed himself to be working at the behest of Apocalypse. He made Mr. Sinister track down and kill several mutants, believing that it would cause his master to manifest on Earth. When he had completed his task, Sinister floated into the air and was transformed into Apocalypse. The X-Men attacked him but didn't count on his ability to take their mutant powers away. He tore off Wolverine's arm and battled both the X-Men and the Morlocks and used his powers to make the two groups fight each other against their will. He then fought a group of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and the Fantastic Four who couldn't hurt him in the slightest. Professor X then attacked with his mental powers, but Apocalypse was somehow able to resist and overpower the Professor. It would have been curtains for Charles, but Jean Grey unleashed the Phoenix Force and destroyed the villain. So, he was able to take on the combined forces of the Morlocks, S.H.I.E.L.D., the X-Men, and the Fantastic Four, and the only force powerful enough to cause him any trouble at all was the Phoenix Force which, by the way, is much less villainous in the Ultimate Universe. Number three, the Hulk. In the mainline Marvel Universe, the Hulk is a misunderstood creature who will go on rampages, but goes out of his way to protect innocent people and ultimately does more good than harm. The Ultimate Hulk is a bit different. In this universe, Bruce Banner grew up hating his scrawny body and was working to develop a new version of the Super Soldier Serum, which he tested on himself, transforming him into the Hulk. This Hulk causes a lot more collateral damage than his 616 version, routinely causing hundreds of deaths when rampaging through cities. He is also known for eating people that he doesn't like. He did a few heroic acts, but on the whole, he has done a lot more harm with his frequent rampages and his eventual team up with the villainous Maker to fight the Ultimates, the 1610 version of the Avengers. Like the classic Hulk, there are very few characters who can stand up to Hulk, and even if they do, his healing factor is so effective efficient that any injuries will soon be healed. If that wasn't intimidating enough, there was a time where this evil Hulk stole the Infinity Gems and used them to fight the heroes. So Hulk with an Infinity Gauntlet. Yikes. Number two, the Green Goblin. This is the villain that got one of the biggest makeovers in the Ultimate Universe. Norman Osborn was trying to develop a super soldier serum, which he called the Oz Formula. After an Oz-infected spider bit Peter Parker and gave him spider powers, Norman theorized that since the Oz and spider DNA had made Peter the way he was, injecting himself with Oz mixed with his own DNA would turn him into a heightened version of himself. Instead, it turned him into a hideous giant goblin creature. While the 616 goblin has super strength and uses a glider with pumpkin bombs, this goblin had insane super strength as well as fortified tissues that made him very difficult to hurt. He had a powerful healing factor and could launch fiery bolts of energy from his hands. True, Spider-Man would often foil his plans and he was presumed dead several times, but his real ace in the hole is that the Oz formula made him immortal, 
so he would always return to life. So, even if you could stop him, it would never be long before he returned for revenge. Number 1. The Maker Reed Richards is often called the smartest man alive in the Marvel Universe, and alongside the Fantastic Four, is one of Earth's greatest heroes. His ego has often led to him making some questionable decisions, but he has been instrumental in saving the Earth from several threats including Galactus and the Skrull. Despite his heroics, we did witness a spectacular fall from grace for Reed in the Ultimate Comic universe, where the combined stress of the Fantastic Four breaking up and Sue Storm rejecting his marriage proposal caused Reed to snap and blow up his childhood home to fake his death, killing his family in the process. He went on to use aliens under his control to attack the heroes. He was eventually defeated and disfigured by the Human Torch and flung into the negative zone. But. Reed returned to Earth and took on the identity of the Maker, and set out on a twisted quest to make the world perfect. He killed all the Asgardians in an attempt to understand Thor's power, and used an antimatter attack on Washington DC, killing POTUS, his cabinet, and all of Congress. The Maker went on to do a lot of twisted stuff, fighting the heroes of his own Earth as well as the heroes of Earth 616, showing just how dangerous Reed Richards can be when his massive brain is turned against Marvel's heroes. He is the ultimate threat to the ultimate universe and just as dangerous to the 616 universe. Coming in at number 10 is Kang the Conqueror. Kang is a little bit of an interesting pick for this list as he totally can be stopped and has been multiple times. Thanks to the advanced time period he comes from though, Nathaniel Richards has an increased lifespan, making him look 40 when he's actually 7 years old. That's fine, that doesn't make him unstoppable. What makes him unstoppable is a couple of things. For starters, as most people know, Kang has a huge relationship with time. A version of this guy exists at almost all moments of the time stream, and not just one version of him, as there have been Kangs from different universes that have shown up as well. So not only can Nathaniel Richards show up at any point in the time stream in any of his numerous identities that all have their own long history, but his alternate universe versions are almost always set to make an appearance in his place. And then, on top of that, until recently, Nathaniel had the ability to transfer his consciousness to another body when he passed away. Nathaniel, Ramatut, Iron Lad, Kid Amortis, Scarlet Centurion, Amortis himself, Mr. Griffin, he who remains whatever you want to call him, Kang the Conqueror is pretty much unstoppable. Number 9. Galactus The being formerly known as Galen of the planet Ta lived before the modern cosmos in the previous cosmos. Galen gestated with the sentience of the universe for billions of years, transforming into the devourer of worlds, finding sustenance by ingesting entire planets, preferably those with living sentient beings that have much more energy for him to harness. Now when Galactus destroys and consumes a planet, he is sort of bringing balance to the universe, kind of like how life is given and taken away every day on Earth, which makes him an essential part of the universe. He's known for the destruction of the Skrull Empire and has attempted to devour the Earth so many freaking times. And I guess other planets for that matter too, or whatever. Galactus is also famous for his heralds such as Silver Surfer and the Cosmic Ghost Rider, and, and so many others. And while they are all powerful beings themselves, usually even before they gain the herald power boost, they don't hold a candle to Galactus himself. His only caveat is that Galactus's power depends on his planet's consumption, so a weakened Galactus has been taken out before, but if he eats like four or more planets or something, he's been able to defeat multiple mad celestials all by himself. He's powered by food, and I think pretty much all of us can, can understand that. Coming in at number 8, Abraxas. Abraxas is the polar opposite of the cosmic entity Eternity. So being the opposite of Eternity, his whole reason for existing is to destroy all of the multiverse, which I'll be honest, there are a few different characters in Marvel who exist for that reason, and funnily enough, a bunch of them are on this list. Abraxas is tied to Galactus too, because when Galactus would consume a planet, it would keep Abraxas in check. So, when Galactus is taken off the board in Galactus the Devourer, Abraxas is released and begins his path of ultimate destruction. As a cosmic entity, Abraxas's powers are essentially limitless, and his whole existence is kind of important to the universe, which means he can't really be taken out like a normal villain. So, how the heck do the heroes come out on top against this guy? Well, in Fantastic Four, 
War number 48 to 50, we learned of an incredibly powerful weapon called the Ultimate Nullifier. It was used back then to threaten Galactus and stop him from destroying our Earth. Now, the heroes, specifically Reed Richards, ended up using the Ultimate Nullifier to essentially rewrite reality, destroying reality, and remaking it so that Abraxas just never existed. That's the route we had to go to here. Kind of makes you wonder why Marvel would even write such a powerful villain in the first place, but. If you're enjoying this list so far, well, we've got a ton more like it on our channel that you should definitely subscribe to. Or you could just like give a thumbs up to this video. That's that's also helpful. Thanks. Number seven, Mephisto. Within the Marvel Universe, Mephisto is, for all intents and purposes, the devil. He isn't actually. Technically, he is a demonic hell lord who rules over his own hell-like dimension and enjoys stealing people's souls by tricking them, and he does that by pretending he is the actual devil playing on people's fears. So basically he's the devil. While Mephisto is within his dimension, which he calls hell, he is immortal, omniscient, and impossible to destroy. It's only when he ventures into other realms that he can be defeated, but doing so just kind of returns him back to his own dimension. He has been a major player in the Marvel Universe since his creation and has been either a key or supporting player for many major events. He was the snake in the old Adam and Eve story. He was directly responsible for the creation of Ghost Rider. He's infamously erased the history of Peter Parker and Mary Jane's marriage in order to save Aunt May's life. I mean, he even popped up a hotel out of the ground in Las Vegas that manipulated the citizens and let him take their souls. He has been defeated and outmaneuvered multiple times, but he has never permanently been stopped. Number six, Horde. The Horde are another insectoid alien race that are so cosmic, it actually hurts me. They're basically the race that is meant to cosmically balance out the Celestials. They are agents of the Fulcrum, along with the Celestials and Watchers. And the Fulcrum, for those who are not familiar with this term, basically represents the balance of the cosmos. In essence, Marvel's God. The Fulcrum is actually known by another name that many may more commonly recognize from Marvel Comics, the one above all. Yeah, so like I said, basically God. The Horde are therefore just made to be a force of destruction to counter the Celestial's force of creation in the universe. Why do they look like insects? Nah, probably because it's just creepier that way. Why did they choose to corrupt the Celestials? Because they could! I'm not really sure how all that factors into the Fulcrum's plans, or if it does at all, but it's a thing that happened at least, so hey, there's that. Number 5, Rakil. La, 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 la. <laughs> I never know how to say this name. Rakil isn't a strange cosmic villain in the sense of her appearance or role, but more is mentioned here because she suddenly popped up in the comics after years of being dead, which is what makes her kind of weird. It had been so long that her return was mostly met with confusion from fans at that point because many who were reading her reappearance didn't actually know who the heck she was. Even I had to do some digging to fully understand the importance of just who this character is. Rakil was once one of the rulers of the Skrull Empire. Unlike Varanki, who was made queen after the Skrull's homeworld fell, and actually who a lot of people thought I think Rakil was at first, Rakil was actually the Skrull Empress, back when the homeworld was still around and doing well. Rakil first appeared back in 1979, and would perish in the comics in issue 257 of Fantastic Four in 1983, only a few short years later. She returned only a few short years ago from now though, so like it's 2023 now, I think she reappeared back in like 2020 or something like that, or 2021, in the Empire event, where she was revealed to be Hulkling's grandmother who survived the destruction of Tarnax 4, and who had been working behind the scenes ever since undercover as a Kree pursuer while putting into motion a plan to make her grandson ruler of the United Skrull and Kree Empires. Which is like, what? <laughs> that was me when I found all that out. Number 4, Annihilus. Annihilus is weird in the most comic book way for a villain. He hails from the negative zone and is also insectoid in appearance, like so many others on our list. Annihilus basically has a cosmic magic wand, if you will, known as the Cosmic Control Rod that he used in his attempt to take over the Negative Zone. In more recent appearances, however, Annihilus actually usually chooses to wear this rod as sort of a protective accessory, using it to protect him against naturally occurring dangers such as aging, heat, and cold, in addition to gaining the ability to fly through space. I mean, at the end of the day, Annihilus is like kind of an insect, so he needs to be protected against those things. He also initially became a villain of the Fantastic Four because they borrowed the Cosmic Rod to help treat the invisible woman during her pregnancy. Though admittedly, they did return the cosmic rod, so I don't know why Annihilus is so angry. I guess if you need something to live, though, you'd be like, hey, don't just take that. 
Number 3, Galactus. When you think about it, Galactus is a pretty weird villain. He's basically a giant man who can fly through the vacuum of space, although he usually prefers to do so from within his own even more enormous spaceship, because I guess he likes having his things with him, who wears a very large hat, has much hunger, and as a result, basically eats planets. Oh, and he's also basically a universal constant, meaning that without his existence, the universe is kind of thrown out of off balance. Despite being an antagonist, you also kind of need him to exist, or at least I mean, you used to need him. I don't really know what's happening with that. Recently, Galactus got dusted in a fight involving the Black Winter and Thor, and the universe still seems to be existing without too much disruption right now. But even that is weird because if we established how Galactus is basically a necessary evil earlier, you'd think his death would cause things to get pretty wonky pretty quickly. Although, to be fair to Donny Cates' current Thor series, that's likely coming in due time because it was kind of hinted at that, yeah, killing Galactus may have been a bad move. Number 2, Impossible Man. Impossible Man is one of my all time favorite weirdos from the cosmic realm of Marvel Comics. He's kind of like Marvel's equivalent of DC's fifth dimensional imp, Mr. Mixia's Pitalik. Impossible Man hails from the planet Pop Up and is known as a Pop Upian. He is often depicted as being more a misguided villain than a malicious one. For the most part, he gets into trouble with heroes because of a misunderstanding or because of kind of his love for pranking. Like Mr. Mixie, he is sometimes an ally to the heroes who he has also been known to torment and is known for being pretty intensely powerful, I'd say. Having molecular manipulation powers which allow him to change his form, shapeshift, and even duplicate himself. Also, he's got a very goofy design that honestly reminds me of a cross between Mr. Mixie and the Coneheads, and I love it. Number 1, Zemnu. Definitely one of the weirdest weirdos out there for me. Even his name sounds so cosmically weird and fantastic. Zemnu. Reminds me of Xanadu, although not at all related to that 80s Olivia Newton John fantasy musical classic, to clarify. Sadly, I wish Zemnu was Xanadu themed, a Xanadu themed villain. <laughs> what would that even be like? I don't know. I'm here for it. Zemnu with like some roller skates on. Zemnu is a Hulk villain. He was an alien cyborg prisoner who escaped from exile only to crash land on Earth. Already, that sounds pretty wild. But hey, it gets weirder. Zemnu initially hoped to control the minds of the people of Earth and get them to build him a new spaceship, one that was so powerful that its launch would actually, in essence, destroy Earth. Zemnu is a psionic being who can hypnotize his victims and control their minds. He can also use Hulk hosts to kind of heal himself, in essence transforming their body into his until there's nothing resembling them or their mind left. Even stranger, Zemnu was technically the first character to be known as the Hulk before the creation of the Bruce Banner turned green giant version of the character, which is even weirder to think about. <laughs> Zemnu's OG Hulk. Number 10, The Kingpin. The way that the Ultimate Universe handles Wilson Fisk is pretty close to how he is in the main 616 universe. He is a kingpin of crime who uses fear and money to avoid the consequences of his criminal actions. His activities are an open secret, but no one can get enough evidence together to actually stop him. Sure, he loses some fights over the course of his time in the comics, but he is unstoppable in a much more realistic and kind of depressing way because of the corruption that he has sown into the city. After obtaining a magical Egyptian relic known as the Zodiac Key, he found that without even having to use the item, it caused enough fear that he could run the city's crime almost unopposed. In a move that is an undeniable win on Fisk's part, he bought the merchandise rights to Spider-Man's likeness, meaning that he was making massive amounts of money off of his enemy. He was eventually arrested after trying to have the ultimate Moon Knight killed, but when the ultimatum wave washed away much of New York, all of the records of his crime were destroyed in the disaster, and he was able to go free. He was permanently stopped when he was thrown out of a window by Mysterio, though. Number 9, Sabretooth. Earth 1610's Victor Creed is quite similar to the original version, with him being a bit of a psycho with claws, heightened senses, and a healing factor. He believed that humans were more cruel than less evolved animals, and therefore, mutants should be even worse. He became a ruthless killer who delighted in causing his victims as much pain as possible before he was eventually recruited to the Weapon X program. After Wolverine left the program, Sabretooth was given similar, though more extensive, adamantium upgrades, and he was sent to retrieve Wolverine. From that point on in his history, Sabretooth came into frequent conflict with the 
X-Men, the Ultimates, and various random heroes of the Ultimate Universe. He soon joined the Ultimate version of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, the Brotherhood of Mutant Superiority, being a consistent thorn in Wolverine's side. Sabretooth makes this list despite the fact that he is frequently apprehended or defeated because of his incredible healing factor. He has been shot, stabbed, and even decapitated, and yet he always comes back. So, though he can be defeated, he can only ever be stopped on a temporary basis. Number 8. Dr. Octopus Doc Ock's origin is pretty much the same as his original. He gets in a lab accident that makes him able to control his metal arms telepathically, and he uses those arms to do crime. However, he is different from the classic Ock in a few ways. This version of Octavius is so linked to his arms that he can control them even when he is separated from them. Such as in Ultimate Spider-Man number 54, when he summoned his arms with his mind and used them to escape prison. After Spider-Man defeated him again, Nick Fury had Ock's arms destroyed in molten steel, thinking that, that would stop Ock once and for all. But we found out that there was another difference between this Ock and the original. He was actually a mutant, with powers similar to Magneto's. He hadn't been controlling the arms, he had been controlling the metal in the arms. He then used this mutant ability to cause metal in the building to form together new arms for himself, and he fought Spider-Man and Spider-Woman in a cyclone of flying shards of metal. So while the old Auk could be stopped by removing his arms, this Auk has way more ways to come back from a loss, and can't be stopped for long. That is, until Green Goblin beat him to death. But hey, that's why he's so low on the list. Number 7. Venom Ultimate Venom is not an alien symbiote, but a genetically engineered suit developed by Eddie Brock and Peter Parker's dads. When when Peter used the symbiote to get his black suit, Eddie became jealous and fused with a sample of the symbiote that was in storage. This caused him to become Venom. While in Venom form, he has an insatiable hunger and has to consume people at a regular rate in order to not be consumed from within the suit. He has all of the classic Venom's powers, like the strength, the healing, the ability to override Peter's spider sense, but unlike the classic Venom, he doesn't have the same level of weakness to sonics and fire. Electricity is his weakness, but his savagery makes him even more dangerous than the original Venom. He became even more powerful when he absorbed the Carnage symbiote, becoming even bigger and monstrous than before. And at 6, Yelena Belova. Yelena Belova, a skilled super spy molded to surpass her idol Black Widow, Natasha Romanoff in the Red Room Academy, faced a harsh lesson from Romanoff herself, revealing the dark reality of being a spy devoid of glory or heroism. This experience led Belova to break away from her masters and forge her own path, and initially while working as a corrupt S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, Belova suffered grave injuries in the Savage Land and was transformed into a super adaptoid by AIM, in return for attacking the Avengers. That's where the whole evil thing comes in, that's where she's the villain. She remained involved with AIM after this, even serving as the Minister of State in Barbuda. Ultimately, Belova met her demise in a conflict between AIM and S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Avengers, but the Red Room, known for cloning its prominent agents like Romanoff and Belova, had their operations disrupted by Romanoff, uh, but still managed to fully restore Belova to life through a clone infused with her memories. I don't know how they got her memories if she was dead, but that's aside the point, I'm not going to question it, it's comics. So reclaiming control over her life, Belova then became an ally to Romanoff and the Avengers, adopting the persona of a White Widow, and taking on the responsibility of training young female spies to empower them with self-defense. So I guess, like, the, the White Room, or... The blue room? I don't know, what's the opposite of red? How about doing a number 5, Hammerhead? As a young boy, Joseph and his family escaped the Soviet Union with the assistance of a man known as the General. However, his childhood was marred by his father who punished him for speaking Italian and subjected him to relentless um, hammerings if you understand what I'm saying. Joseph's attempts to conceal his true Russian identity were exposed by a bully named Rico at school, who not only revealed his lie, but also took away his hat, exposing the scars on his forehead. Seeking acceptance in the mob, Joseph, now known as Hammerhead, killed Rico and his girlfriend, successfully convincing the mob that he was Italian. After a severe head injury and a brawl, Hammerhead's shattered skull was replaced with a steel one by Jonas Harrow, upping the ante of his existing mental and emotional issues. Upon waking, Hammerhead fixated on a 1920s movie poster, adopting the persona of a mobster from that era, complete with clothing, weaponry, speech patterns, and behavior. In this new identity, he disavowed his real name, claiming to have no recollection of it, and just became Hammerhead. 
but I mean, given your origin of Hammerhead, yikes. That's dark. That's a dark way to get a name. Man, me oh my. It's hammer time. <laughs> In at four, Punisher. He's known for his violent methods and his high-tech weapons, including his battle van. It's Frank Castle. He works with Chip, who monitors him through a computer, and his iconic symbol is a large white skull in the middle of his chest. Punisher went to New York City, thinking that Spider-Man was behind a string of attacks at Empire State University. In the 90s animated series, at least, which is my favorite version. Later, he would be convinced of this when Spider-Man mutated into Man Spider. He was later captured and taken to a parked garage at the World Trade Center by Kraven the Hunter and Mirage. Crawford. With their powers combined, they cured Spider-Man and actually returned him to being Spider-Man. Punisher later returned and thought that Peter Parker was the Green Goblin and that he had kidnapped Mary Jane Watson. But uh, that wasn't the case, obviously. And then he captured Harry Osborn, but wanted to know what Peter knew about Mary Jane's disappearance. But ironically, he knew about it, but he just he, he couldn't because he was Spider-Man and not the Green Goblin. But but yeah. Then Mary Jane's clone appears and Punisher lets Peter go. So yeah, it was a whole whirlwind, but um, I like that version of Frank Castle. <laughs> but yeah, I just, there you go. In at three, Winter Soldier. James Buchanan, Bucky Barnes, initially an American soldier, experienced a significant transformation in his life when he was recruited into the US Army during World War II. Serving alongside his best friend Captain America and the invaders, they played a crucial role in securing victory for the Allies. However, Bucky was presumed dead near the war's end, only to resurface as the brainwashed Winter Soldier, carrying out covert operations and commitments ruthless assassins under the control of the Soviets, particularly Vasily Karpov. For several decades, he operated under this role until his memories were restored, prompting him to assume the mantle of Captain America following Steve Rogers' apparent demise, while also becoming a member of the Avengers. However, when Steve returned, Bucky resumed his identity as the Winter Soldier once again, returning to his complex and multifaceted journey, which is different from the version in the MCU, but hey, there you go. That's, that's just one of the things they had to change for the MCU, because, I mean, making a random Winter Soldier Soviet wouldn't make sense in the context of that universe. So yeah, they were like, yeah, let's uh, let's make him let's let's make him Hydra. Penultimately, in number two, Venom. Again, someone else that I don't think should be street level, but here we go. During the rule of the Dark Elder God Null, the origins of the symbiote that would later become known as Venom remain largely obscured. Its history, priving to arriving on Battleworld, is muddled as its memories have been repeatedly erased, modified, and tampered with. But some sources suggest that it may be the first symbiote created by Null, while others claim it to be the 998th in its lineage. Cast out by its kind for defying Null's commands, the symbiote was found by Kree explorers who bonded it with a soldier named Telkar. They harnessed its shape-shifting abilities to infiltrate the Skull Armada, but Telkar eventually severed their connection and wiped the symbiote's memories to protect it from capture. After parting ways during a crash landing, the symbiote later bonded with, with an unnamed alien who used it to commit side against their own species, fueling the symbiote's addiction to rage. At some point, an arms dealer claimed to have captured the symbiote and enhanced its aggression and bloodlust through chemical alterations, although the symbiote itself has no recollection of these events. Then it later bonds to Spider-Man, and then you all know the rest. But yeah, I, I like the symbiotes. Venom is pretty dope. But again, he's literally from space. I don't know how he's a street level villain, but I guess most of his antics revolve around just being mad at Spider-Man, so there you, I guess it makes sense. And finally, in at number one, Street. This is the most street level villain that I can talk about because his name is literally Street. God. Henry Kramer was an employee at Industrico, a company working on an experimental asphalt polymer. Tragically, he fell into the mixer, becoming engulfed in the compound. The asphalt mutated his body, transforming him into a vengeful giant asphalt figure known as Street, terrorizing New York City. Street clashed with Spider Man and the Human Torch, escaping their grasp by assimilating into the streets. However, he was crushed by the alien goon and later defeated by the Fantastic Four. Reconstructing himself multiple times, Street continued his quest for revenge, only to be repeatedly crushed and defeated by these heroes. Each time he rebuilt himself though, Street faced the wrath of the Fantastic Four, who ultimately left him in pieces. Despite his determination, Street found himself constantly crushed and thwarted by the heroes, vowing revenge but unable to achieve it. But there you go, he is literally Street level because he is literally the Street. And it's 10, Mr. Negative. I always feel weird giving people with superpowers like the street level moniker just because well you know they have superpowers and street level in my eyes would be those without powers who are just like martial artists like Green Arrow, Batman, Daredevil since his power is just more advanced Superman glasses but I think that like street level villains are actually at least for 
Marvel standards are based on their intentions, not their abilities. Because Spider-Man has to hold back his strength when fighting, but he still fights the street crime of New York. And that's where Mr. Negative comes from. At the outset of his rise, Martin Lee, also known as Mr. Negative, seized control of the White Dragons gang and absorbed the Snakeheads into his organization. Despite portraying himself as a benevolent philanthropist running the Feast Soup Kitchen where May Parker volunteers, Martin Lee concealed his true identity as the Chinatown crime lord Mr. Negative. Despite his criminal activities, Lee maintained a facade of kindness and generosity. Spider-Man first encountered Mr. Negative when he sought to dominate New York's criminal underground by eliminating members of the Carnelli and Magia crime families using a bioweapon known as Devil's Breath, which is like the whole plot of Spider-Man PS4, which is still a great game that came out on my birthday, so. Hell yeah. 10 out of 10, do you recommend. In at 9, Bullseye. Bullseye is a mysterious mercenary who shrouds his past in uncertainty. During an interrogation in a high security prison, he revealed some details about his early life, including an incident where his brother supposedly tried to kill their father by setting their house on fire. However, Bullseye's escape following this revelation and his taunting of the interrogators does cast doubt on the actual authenticity of those words. He admitted that he had lied, confessing that he was the one who set the the house on fire, not his brother, but in another account of his childhood, he recounted a chilling act of violence where his father was drunk and unconscious. Bullseye painted a bullseye on his forehead and then shot him, which kind of gives him his whole thing later, which is kind of messed up. Actually, it's incredibly messed up. But yeah, there's, there's conflicting stories and dark actions on either side, um, but yeah, yeah, he's he's Daredevil's villain, and he's just he's just the dude who's, who's good who has good aim. I'm pretty sure. I don't think he has any superpowers. I could be wrong, but yeah, that, that's uh, that's Bullseye for you, whose name is also Lester, which is just. I get why he goes by Bullseye. When I hear Lester, I think the dude from GTA 5. And that is not a scary dude. In at 8, Typhoid Mary. Mary's traumatic experiences led to the emergence of her second persona. Endowed with latent mutant abilities encompassing mind control, telepathy, and pyrokinesis. Subsequently, she found herself confined in a mental institution, diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. While the true origin of her powers remains a mystery, as a child, Mary exhibited a sweet and cooperative nature, but suffered from illness and epilepsy. Unaware of her contrasting alter ego, Typhoid, named after her constant fever. Typhoid eventually escaped the facility, taking Mary along, because you know, they're, they're one person, and she embarked on an acting career that soared to fame before abruptly vanishing, believed to be caused by Typhoid's actions, which derailed her success. During her time as an actress, she encountered Matt Murdock prior to his transformation into Daredevil. When he targeted a criminal in the brothel where Mary worked, operating under the employ of Kingpin, she frequently clashed with Daredevil and formed a complex romantic relationship with Matt Murdock, which is just a whole slate. It's multiple layers of weird. That's like Felicia Hardy and Peter Parker dating, but then also fighting each other as Black Cat and Spider-Man, which I guess does happen at one point, but like, you know, you know what I mean. It's still weird. And it's Seven Tombstone. Lonnie Lincoln, born and raised in Harlem, New York City, faced a childhood of isolation due to his albinism and speech impediment. His pale skin and whispered voice made him an outcast, except for Joe Robertson, an aspiring journalist who Lonnie mistakenly believed to be his friend. Seeking validation, Lonnie turned to a intense exercise and transformed into a school bully, using his size and strength to intimidate and extort money from his peers, earning him the moniker of Tombstone. I don't know why they're giving you the nickname of Tombstone in high school, but whatever. However, when Lonnie discovered that Robertson was investigating and planning to expose his activities in the school newspaper, he felt betrayed and violently attacked him, attempting him to attempting to coerce him into abandoning the story. But um, yeah, no, it, it, it didn't. And then he becomes a criminal mastermind. There's a story for you. Yeah, don't bully people so that they then turn into bullies and then become criminal masterminds who are like you you really can't punch otherwise you'll you'll break your hand unless you're Spider-Man. And it's six Rhino. Alexi, also known as Rhino, possesses a powerful armor that permanently was fused with his body. Resembling the height of a rhinoceros, the scientists Igor and Gregory designed the armor based on a Rhino's evolutionary traits for armored assault. Rhino's initial mission was to kidnap astronaut John Jameson, but he later turned on his employers and embarked on his own agenda. Spider-Man realized that Rhino had limitations in changing direction once he started charging and exploited his lack of intelligence. Using his technical skills and agility, 
Spider-Man could defeat Rhino on various occasions, but sent him to a specialized correctional hospital where he was kept heavily sedated. Eventually, he ends up like getting the skin dissolved, I'm pretty sure, and then he ends up getting the robot one that we also see in the Spider-Man PS4 game, and then in Miles Morales, but like, still, the dude's a freaking Rhino, okay? That you can't really get more than street when you're a rhino who's dumb and can only run in a straight line after you start charging. You can't really do more than that. You ain't gonna be fighting the watcher, okay? Sorry, but it's true. Halfway through into number five, Modok. George Tarleton, also known as Modok, the mental organism designed only for killing, was a technician working for AIM when he was transformed into a human computer by the scientist Supreme. <laughs> yeah, I know, Sorcerer Supreme, scientist. Is supreme come on where's the nacho supreme where's the fries supreme i want to know i'm hungry okay I'm, i haven't had breakfast today relax his brain was enlarged to grant him superhuman intellect but his frail body couldn't handle the massive cranium leading him to be confined to a life support unit called the doomsday chair this process also bestowed him with psychic powers fueling his ambition and ego modok seized control of aim and clashed with captain america when he attempted to rescue sharon carter and in the ensuing battle, AIM turned against MODOK and they all tried to escape. He initiated a self-destruct sequence, leaving them with only moments to escape the impending explosion, but a bigger brain doesn't mean that you're smarter. That's, that's not how that works. If your brain gets bigger, you should see a doctor, okay? That, that, that's like an aneurysm or, or a tumor or something. Intelligence isn't the size of your brain. It, it's the wrinkles, I'm pretty sure. And if you like what we're doing here, also call a doctor. And also like and subscribe. In it for Red Skull. Upon becoming inspired by the Bellboy's loyalty, Schler, <laughs> uh, you're gonna censor it anyway, might as well say it fun, decided to mold him into the ideal German soldier and his right-hand man. Eager to comply with his superior's wishes, the Bellboy, Johann Schmidt, accepted the offer. Initially, his leader's subordinates attempted to train Schmidt as a a regular soldier, which enraged his, let's call him his dad, even though he's not his dad, but I, I mean, I could say it, but people here don't want me to say it. Let's just say dad. That enraged his dad, which had a different vision in mind. Taking matters into his own hands, his dad personally oversaw Schmidt's training, providing him with a lifelike Red Skull-esque mask and calling him the Red Skull. The Red Skull became solely accountable to his dad and embarked on various missions that involved spreading terror, particularly in the United States before its entry into World War II. To counter the Red Skull's actions, the United States government created the persona of Captain America, who would become the Red Skull's main adversary in their ongoing conflict. But I think you know who I'm talking about when I say dad. Getting close to the end of number three, Taskmaster. Tony Masters possesses the unique ability to replicate any observed movement, allowing him to learn various skills rapidly throughout his life. As a child, he quickly mimicked actions such as diving and mastering sports techniques that he was seeing on TV, and therefore joined S.H.I.E.L.D. as an adult. Tony's life took a turn though when he encountered a dying scientist who provided him with a syringe containing a German soldier's version of the super soldier serum that Captain America had. Inject himself with the serum, Tony gained additional powers but suffered memory loss as his new abilities overwrote his personal recollections. His wife and partner, Mercedes Masters, devised a system to control and guide him as Taskmaster, utilizing muscle memory and reflexive tasks. Mercedes also kind of served as his handler, helping him to stay focused despite his continually changing memory. Taskmaster's past with S.H.I.E.L.D. and his personal connections, including his relationship with Mercedes, become uh, a, a distant to him and his new persona kind of took precedence, which is why he, he becomes evil. But also, being able to look at someone and recreate their ab abilities or whatever would be so freaking sick. I mean, I would probably also end up using it for evil, but I mean, come on. That would be great. But ultimately, in number two, Ultron. Ultron is just, he's a dude. And like, let's, or he's not a dude, he's a robot. But like, he's, he's just, he's just a robot dude who doesn't really do much more. I mean, he can, he definitely can. But he was still listed on the wiki as a street level. So, um, there you go, okay? You know the story of Ultron. Uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about the one that fights the Watcher after gaining all the Infinity Stones. Because that's definitely not street level. But hey, normal Ultron, yeah. 
Yeah, 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 that's that's pretty street level. Not All Maker Ultron, I'm pretty sure that's one of his names. Not nah, none of those, okay? Just the normal art Ultron that was like corrupt Jarvis, a street level. And you know what? He he probably was just made out of a, a lamp post. And finally, in the number one, Carnage. Uh, same reasons as Venom, kind of. I mean, like the fact that he's not really trying to destroy literally the galaxy is probably why he's considered to be a street level, despite also technically coming from space because he's the spawn of Venom. But also he merged with Cletus Cassidy, who was a serial killer. So yeah, after doing that, you're not really gonna wanna do much else other than just kill people. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's that's kind of it. A symbiote bonded with a psychopath who just wants to harm Earth, so you're not really gonna get much higher than the streets that you are literally turning red. Number 10. Doctor Doom. Some of you are already typing your comments claiming that Victor Von Doom is not a villain and is instead an anti-hero. I would disagree, saying that he's at best an anti-villain, but honestly if I didn't include him I'd be getting just as many comments complaining about his exclusion, so let's put him at the bottom and agree that Doctor Doom started out as a villain and has become more nuanced and difficult to peg down in the years since. Victor Von Doom was the child of Romani people living in Latveria. His mother was a sorceress and after her and his father's passing, Victor began to study her books, teaching himself the dark arts. He also developed a keen scientific mind, which made him a legendary scientist and inventor at a very young age, and led to him being tracked down by the US military and offered further education in the States. It was here that he met Reed Richards, with whom he developed a lifelong rivalry. While still in school, he developed his infamous Doom bots and also built a functional time machine. He was disfigured in an accident that resulted in his expulsion, and he went on to become the leader of some monks who helped him build his iconic armor. He became the main antagonist of the Fantastic Four and the dictator of the country of Latveria, causing lots of problems for the heroes of the Marvel Universe. His status as one of the most brilliant minds on Earth, as well as him being one of the Earth's most powerful sorcerers, combined with his diplomatic immunity, makes him a force to be reckoned with for both the heroes and the villains of the Marvel Universe. And number nine is Sabretooth. Sabretooth is like the darker, bigger, and stronger brother of Wolverine. He isn't actually Wolverine's brother, but the fights between Wolverine and Sabretooth were the absolute most bloody, knockdown, down, drag out, legendary fights that go to such drastic extremes, and that's because neither of these guys can really be stopped, since they both possess an absolutely massive, powerful healing factor. They share a lot of qualities, honestly. Sabretooth has adamantium laced bones and claws, superhuman senses, superhuman attributes, and even psionic resistance as well. The thing about Sabretooth is that he is just pure animalistic fury, a mindless killing machine, but one who has the training to make him just that much more of a force to be reckoned with. Even when he is stopped, he's almost never fully destroyed because of that damn healing factor that makes him next to impossible to bring down. Sure, he doesn't warp reality or cross dimensional barriers, but even when he was thrown into the pit on Krakoa, where he was trapped alive but unable to move, he still proved a problem as he figured out how to escape. Magneto. When Mac Eisenhardt was a young man in Germany, he was subjected to many atrocities at the hands of the Third Reich, who sent him to Auschwitz for no reason other than being Jewish. He eventually escaped and became known as Eric Lenscher. He discovered that he had the ability to control the powers of magnetism, and after the war, used them to track down former German soldiers. He developed the belief that mutants in humanity could not coexist and became Magneto, a mutant dedicated to mutant superiority and the leader of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. He fought the X-Men several times over the years, but they eventually came to an uneasy truce, working together to form a refuge for their kind on the island of Krakoa, which is good for everyone as Magneto is a very difficult villain to stop and has stood up to the entire Avengers team, once reversed the Earth's magnetic poles, and also created a global EMP which took out the world's technology, showing that he could plunge us back to the Dark Ages whenever he wants. Number 7. Apocalypse The name of the game for Apocalypse or En Sabanur is survival of the fittest. His powers manifested back in ancient Egypt with the powers of immortality and the ability to alter the molecular structure.
structure of his own body. Now, we unfortunately have to talk about time travel here. I'm sorry. While Apocalypse has history with Kang the Conqueror as Rama Tut, the more important time traveler that Apocalypse deals with is Nathan Summers, aka Cable. In the future world of Cable, Apocalypse had conquered the world, so in order to stop that, Nathan went back to ancient Egypt to defeat Apocalypse. Now, during that fight, the techno organic arm of Cable bonded to Apocalypse, who used it to interact with a celestial spaceship and integrate all of its technology into himself, amplifying and enhancing his existing powers, allowing him to do pretty much anything. He can teleport, interface with any technology, grant himself almost any power like strength, flight, energy beams, telepathy, telekinesis, and all kinds of stuff. Obviously, it all depends on the story he's in. He's so incredibly OP that his powers wax and wane based on the story. Like in the X-Men animated TV show, he grew to like a thousand feet tall and just used energy beams to completely vaporize the X-Men. And that could totally happen in the comics too at any point if it served the story. Usually he just sends out his horsemen to test the mutants though. The thing that makes him even more unstoppable is his ability to move his spiritual essence into new host bodies when his physical body is either worn out from his massive power or destroyed in a fight. Number 6, The One Below All In Marvel Comics, there is a character called The One Above All, who hasn't really been seen all too often, but is essentially the equivalent to God or the Creator. We have gods like Odin and Zeus and Thor in Marvel Comics and the MCU, but this is a little bit different. The One Above All is like the God of everything, the supreme ruler of creation and compassion. It's even been represented as the writers of Marvel at one point to give you an idea. So, the one below all, as you can imagine, is the antithesis to this. The personification of destruction and hate. Another way of looking at it is that the one below all is actually the one above all's hulked out form. Although, that makes things a little bit more complex in some ways. The one below all is trapped in the below place and manifests itself in reality through gamma and gamma mutates. Basically, this means that Hulk and the other gamma mutated beings have fractions of the one below all's power and can be taken over by the one below all for him to try and escape and destroy literally everything. In an alternate future, the one below all actually does this, taking over Bruce Banner's body and using his power to devour the cosmic entity Eternity and eradicate all life in not only this version of the cosmos, but even going into the next iteration of the multiverse, ensuring that nothing in the universe will ever continue to be. Luckily, this is prevented in the Immortal Hulk story, but I'm telling you, go read it. Number 5, The Black Winter You know, Galactus made this list, but why choose him when we can choose the bigger version of Galactus? Where Galactus consumes individual planets, the Black Winter devours entire realities. The Black Winter, the Star Plague, the Blightstorm, the Rot Blizzard, or the Thimble Winter, if you want, was the one who brought the end of the sixth iteration of the universe, leaving only Galen of the planet Ta, like we talked about before. When the Black Winter arrives in the Marvel Universe, this iteration of it, in the latest run of Thor, Galactus turns an all-father Thor, who possesses the Thor Force, into his Herald of Thunder, granting him the power cosmic and an attack from this Thor only stops the Black Winter for a total of 14 seconds. That's how powerful this multiversal entity is. Luckily, at this time, the Black Winter isn't here to destroy the universe. He is just here for his herald, Galactus. But luckily, Thor turns Galactus into a massive power cosmic explosion that destroys the Black Winter in his entirety, and it's incredibly awesome. Number 4, Thanos. Thanos, who made his debut in Iron Man number 55, February of 1973, has only one goal, and that goal is to conquer the galaxy. Sort of. If you are only familiar with his movie adaptation, then you may not know that comics Thanos is not really much of an altruistic dude. The Mad Titan doesn't seek to eliminate half of life in the known universe in order to create a better one, he simply wanted to impress a girl, but not in the same way you might think. Thanos has a thing for death. In fact, he fell in love with the Mistress Death who is the physical embodiment of death in Marvel Comics. To prove his love to her, he was going to destroy all the life in the universe universe, and that's what led to him assembling the Infinity Stones and trying to wield the Cosmic Cube. He's really just a cosmic level serial unaliver. Thanos was born on Titan, a moon of Saturn, and is technically an Eternal, but he possessed a deviant gene which made him very different looking. He was bullied for this as a child, and as such, Thanos distances himself
himself from the society, and he even starts dissecting animals. He has gone far in his obsession with Mistress Death, kidnapping his own mother and taking her apart, training his daughter to become an assassin, and even sending a targeted nuclear strike at his own homeworld. He has the power of telekinesis and matter manipulation, has superhuman intellect, can master any technology, time travel, teleport, and is an incredibly powerful and scary dude. Number 3 The Beyonder The Beyonder is a singular entity with no duplicate versions of himself in other universes, similar to the Phoenix. And a lot like the Phoenix, Beyonder is basically like a baby, in that he is a younger member of a race called the Beyonders, that are a near omnipotent alien race from a dimension outside of the multiverse. He is himself basically a whole universe, it's really hard to explain. But as he observes Earth and the Marvel Universe and the various races, he grows curious and the Beyonder decides to study and analyze life and humanity, good and evil, and conflict. And to that purpose, he pits Earth's mightiest heroes and villains against each other in the Secret Wars, the very first one. Now he did this by destroying an entire system of planets and creating battle world from the remains and from parts of Earth. So that's one level of power right there. Beyonder's powers surpass that of eternity and the living tribunal himself, and he is capable of manipulating reality to his will, being able to pretty much do whatever he wants and grant himself any power he wants. It is more nuanced, but it's incredibly difficult to explain, and I don't have that much time. So we're moving on. Number two, Dormammu. Dormammu is one of a race of extra dimensional energy beings called the Faultine. Him and his sister Umar are both mutants of the species who seek to consume matter instead of energy, which is a big no no among the Faultine. And along with taking out their own pops, it caused them to be banished. They both traveled to the dark dimension, and eventually Dormammu took it over. Dormammu is the prime enemy of the Vishanti, the gods who give the Sorcerer Supreme his supreme merch and is stated by Odin to be his equal in power. He is more powerful than even the greatest sorcerers, including Doctor Strange and the Ancient One, and he can banish anyone from his domain, the Dark Dimension, but usually fights them for a bit of the old sport. He also has super strength, astral projection, matter transmutation, interdimensional teleportation, flight, can change his appearance and size, can control the elements, time travel, and project and absorb energy. He's also immortal, if that mattered, and has a regenerative healing factor, which seems kind of useless if you're immortal, but hey, I just work here. And finally, in at number one is Shuma Gorath. Shuma Gorath is one of the greatest of the leaders of the Old Ones, also known as the Many Angled Ones. Think like Lovecraftian Old Gods, and that's basically the Old Ones. So cosmic horror, tentacles, and madness, all that good stuff. Shuma Gorath is the ruler of hundreds of dimensions and is said to be older than the universe itself. It has many mystical powers, including the ability to communicate and control others across dimensions, create mystical energy blasts from his eye and tentacles, and can transmute things on a planetary scale. He can destroy multiple galaxies with his aura pressure ability and can destroy realities by using his tentacles to create a ball of energy that he just launches at entire realities. I don't even know how that makes sense. They first fully premiered in Marvel Premiere Volume 1, number 10, and in the comic, Shuma Gorath ends up using the mind of the Ancient One, Doctor Strange's mentor, as a portal to the dimension of Earth. Doctor Strange goes into the Ancient One's mind to battle the defenses of Shuma Gorath and fight his way into its realm, only to realize that the only way to win and to defeat Shuma Gorath is to actually take out the Ancient One himself. He's forced to do it, and it leads to him becoming the Sorcerer Supreme for the very first time. Starting off at number 10 today is Null. Null is the literal eldritch god of all symbiotes, their creator. Null existed before the current version of the universe ever even came be in the black void of nothingness. One of his very first acts after he was awoken by the light created by the formation of the universe was creating the all black necrosword. This was the very first symbiote and it was immensely powerful. Using it, Null was able to slice the head clean off of a celestial. For this insane feat of power, he was banished to a void where he worked more and more on the sword and eventually he broke free and went out into the universe with the intent of wiping out various different gods until he was defeated and he lost the sword to Gore the God Butcher. And if we want to talk about villains who 
should have been more powerful in the MCU, he's top of the list. Null then goes on to make more and more symbiotes all share a hive mind under the control of Null. They eventually rebel and imprison Null inside the symbiote homeworld Clintar, which is actually symbiote for Cage. He's one of the strongest villains Marvel Comics has shown us. He faced off against all the Earth's heroes and nearly won. He has awoken, enslaved, and controlled Celestials and even defeated the Sentry, ripping him in half and absorbing the Void. The only thing that defeated him was Eddie Brock's Venom wielding the Unipower, aka Captain Universe, the protector of the universe and the opposite to everything that Null represents. Number 9, Abraxas. Abraxas is the polar opposite of the cosmic entity known as Eternity. This essentially means his whole reason for existing is to destroy all of the multiverse, which I'll be honest, there are a few different characters in Marvel who exist for that very reason. And funnily enough, a bunch of them are on this list. Abraxas is also tied to the incredibly unstoppable cosmic entity, Galactus. Whenever Galactus would consume a planet, it would keep Abraxas in check. So when Galactus was actually destroyed in a story called Galactus the Devourer, Abraxas was released and begins his path of ultimate destruction. As a cosmic entity, Abraxas's powers are essentially limitless, and his whole existence is kind of important to the universe, which means he can't really be taken out like a normal villain would be. So, the question of how he was defeated is kind of important. In Fantastic Four, number 48 to number 50, we learned of an incredibly powerful tool called the Ultimate Nullifier. It was used back then to threaten Galactus and stop him from destroying the Earth. Reed Richards ended up using the Ultimate Nullifier to essentially rewrite reality, remaking it so that Abraxas just never existed. Abraxas is so unstoppable that we essentially needed a deus ex machina to defeat him. Number 8, the Chaos King. Amatsu Mikubashi, first appearing in Thor Blood Oath number 6 in 2006, is the Japanese god Chaos, Evil, and an aspect of the cosmic being known as Oblivion. Mikubashi ruled and thrived over the Earth when it was nothing more than a formless void of primordial darkness. And as such, his goal now is to bring it back to that age of chaos and void and darkness. He is a primordial being who was imprisoned in Yom the Shinto underworld, where he remained for centuries accruing an army of Oni, Shinma demons, and other monsters. During the events of Ares' God of War, Chaos King attacks Olympus after he had defeated and controlled the Japanese pantheon after the fall of Asgard during Ragnarok. This is what kickstarts his mission in Chaos War, where he slays the Egyptian gods, Celtic gods, Shi'ar gods, and gods of Zen La. He takes out Nightmare in the Dream Dimension, destroys Mephisto somehow, and casts Mistress Death out of hell, making her literally run away, and releases the souls of the damned. He has the power to defeat Eternity, and is, and is practically unfazed by attacks from the likes of someone like Zeus. God Hercules, Galactus, Silver Surfer, and Thor teamed up together but could not defeat Chaos King. To win, this insanely powerful god of gods, Hercules, had to punch him into a portal to an endless void of nothingness. And this was after he had already destroyed about 98% of the universe. Number 7, Galactus. The being formerly known as Galen of the planet Ta lived before the modern cosmos in the previous iteration of the cosmos. Galen gestated with the sentience of the universe for billions of years, transforming into the devourer of worlds, finding sustenance by ingesting entire planets, preferably those with living sentient beings that have much more energy for him to harness. He is sort of bringing balance to the universe, kind of like how life is given and taken away every day on Earth, which makes him an essential part of the universe. He's known for the destruction of the Skrull Empire and has attempted to devour the Earth on so many different occasions. And I guess he's tried to devour other planets too, for that matter, but you know, like whatever. Galactus is also famous for his heralds though, such as Silver Surfer, the Fallen One, and the Cosmic Ghost Rider, to name a few. And while they are all powerful beings themselves, usually even before they gain the herald power boost, they don't actually hold a candle to Galactus himself. His only caveat is that Galactus's power depends on his planet's consumption. So a weakened Galactus who hasn't eaten a planet has been taken out before, but if he eats like four or more planets, he's pretty much unstoppable and has been able to defeat multiple mad celestials by himself. He's powered by food, and I think pretty much all of us can understand that. Number six, Hela. Hela is the daughter of Loki, who was appointed by Odin to be the goddess of death. He would come to regret this choice, as Hela soon began several attempts to steal his and his son Thor souls and to conquer Asgard for herself. In one of her most disturbing plots, she cursed Thor with immortal life 
but a frail and decrepit body. She eventually reversed this and moved to Las Vegas, where she began to feed upon the souls of the unlucky. As the goddess of death, she can't really die and is able to heal any injury with great speed, even being able to come back from disintegration. She has the power to kill immortal beings with a simple touch, making her a force to be reckoned with for Thor, let alone the normal human heroes he works with. Number 5. The Fury Many people may actually not know of the Fury, and there's a rather simple reason for that. The Fury came about in Marvel Super Heroes UK, which is Marvel's attempt to branch out to British audiences and revamp Captain Britain. But it was also a way for Marvel to open up and explain the concept of the multiverse, and this all happened in the Crooked World story. This story deals with one of the most powerful reality warping mutants ever, named Mad Jim Jaspers on Earth 238. But he's not even the focus of this point. Mad Jim Jaspers became the leading political leader in England, rallying the people against superheroes, and he created what was essentially a robot called the Fury, for the sole purpose of taking down superheroes, and my lord, the Fury is good at it. In the matter of two years, the Fury decimated every single superpowered being on Earth 238, except for Jim Jaspers. The Fury is similar to the Sentinels we see in the X Men Days of Future Past movie, because this robot can analyze superhuman powers or any threat and modify its own defenses and capabilities to combat it. But it can also fire extremely potent energy blasts and and even restore itself after being completely destroyed. The Fury ends up completely obliterating Captain Britain, causing him to be revived. And that was all a test for Captain Britain to face the much more powerful Mad Jim Jaspers from Earth 616. Now, the universe of Earth 238 gets destroyed, but the Fury adapts to even that and develops the ability to travel across dimensional barriers to continue its mission. The only thing going against this being is that he doesn't have a ton of appearances, so it's kind of hard to judge him against other beings. Number 4. Thanos Thanos was born on one of Saturn's moons, Titan, and had the deviant gene, which gave him thick purple skin as well as superior strength and heightened powers. He fell in love with a woman who turned out to be death, and dedicated his life to impressing her by destroying as many living things as possible. Thanos has conquered countless worlds in his quest to impress death, and is responsible for unleashing unspeakable horrors upon them. For instance, when he conquers a world, it is not uncommon for him to demand a tribute of the heads of everyone from the ages of 16 to 22. This insane demand is part of his plan to fulfill a request from death to rid the universe of any of his offspring, and rather than put in the time to find out where and who his children are, he chooses to save time by implementing this method. As he is pretty much unstoppable for anyone but the most powerful superheroes, most planets are forced to go along with his insane demands. In his most iconic moment, he came up with a plan to acquire the Infinity Gems and wipe out half of all life in the universe in order to impress his love. Unlike many other evildoers who make these elaborate plans and then fail, Thanos actually pulled this off, getting all the gems and using the Infinity Gauntlet to enact his deadly romantic gesture. Number 3. The Void I think one of my favorite things that Marvel's done is create the Sentry. Essentially, a Superman-like character, but like, in my opinion, way cooler. A large part of what makes him so much better is that while he is essentially a godlike superhero who inspired all the other heroes who exist, he also has a dark persona called The Void. The Void went on a rampage that took the lives of around a million people and almost destroyed Manhattan. And so, Sentry made the decision with other heroes like Reed Richards and Doctor Strange to cause the entire world to forget about his existence. Now, in New Avengers, which started in 2004-2005, the Sentry comes back to the world, and through a series of events, the Void also returns. Full rosters of the Avengers, X-Men, and the Fantastic Four all went to take on the Void, and they couldn't do a damn thing. Only the Sentry himself could really subdue the Void, and it, in classic supervillain fashion, vowed to come back. And it totally did! In the Siege event, Norman and Osborn decided to attack Asgard, and he used the Sentry to do this. Problem is that the Sentry ended up unleashing the Void, and it totally obliterated Asgard completely, taking out Loki in the process. This did actually branch off into a what if story where the Void was never stopped and destroyed every superhero on Earth, and then went off into the universe to basically do the same thing. The Void exists as long as the Sentry exists, and the Sentry keeps on coming back to life every time he somehow gets defeated. The Sentry is basically a god, and the void is this god's devil. Number two, 
Zom. Just because Zom looks like your uncle's hairy big toe does not mean that you should underestimate him. Zom is one of the most powerful and scary extra dimensional entities in existence, being described as worse than a dozen Umars. Umar is the sister of Dormammu, for anyone who wanted to know. Now, speaking of Dormammu, it took all of his power, plus the help of the cosmic being Eternity, just to restrain Zom with the magical chain called the Links of Living Bondage and with an object called the Crown of Blindness. And with these tools, these massively powerful beings managed to trap Zom in a jar. Now, I know it sounds silly, I'm downplaying it. It was actually an amphora, and Zom was trapped in a quote, world beyond worlds, in a quote, time beyond all time. That was just his origin story though. Eons into the future in Strange Tales number 156 from 1967, Doctor Strange unleashed Zom in a fight against Umar, but that was a mistake because now Strange had no way of taking on Zom, like at all. He had to turn to the Living Tribunal, the personification of multiversal law, the representative for the one above all, and the highest authority in the multiverse just to banish Zom. Zom wasn't really released again, but Strange did channel Zom's power in a fight against Worldbreaker Hulk when that event happened, and using that power, he did indeed pummel the hell out of the Hulk until Strange started to lose control and pass out. Lastly, in Doctor Strange's final recent moments, he was taken down by the Hood, who held an assault on the Sanctum Sanctorum with like 50 other villains, and Strange managed to rise again, but channeling the power of Zom, which he used to take out everyone. Then, Strange left the mortal plane. Number one, the one below all. So, the one above all is the ruler of the multiverse and the creator of all life in it. Although he is the source of love and good, he also has an evil form known as the one below all, who is the personification of hatred and destruction. The ruler of the lowest point of reality, the below place, it is able to manifest itself on Earth through the mutagenic form of gamma radiation. This means that when Bruce Banner was caught in the Gamma Bomb, he was infused with this dark entity's power. The One Below All wants to become the only remaining thing in the multiverse and to destroy everything else. As he is incapable of having his own personality without a host, it waited until Hulk's father, Brian Banner, died to merge with him and take on his personality. The leader eventually managed to absorb Brian's soul in hopes of learning more about the One Below All, but was possessed by it instead. He is a terrifying foe who can never really be killed, and who as a dark aspect of the one above all, is technically also the creator of everything he's trying to destroy. If you want more information on the one below all, check out our video attempting to explain the immortal Hulk, where he is the puppet master pulling all the strings against the green Goliath.